Okay, uh, thanks for inviting me. My name is uh, Jakub Scholz. I work for Red Hat, as you probably see from the slides. And uh, I prepared some uh, talk about Kafka. The first part will be a more, uh, let's say, theoretical, uh, explaining how Kafka works and uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages, and so on. And in the second part, I will show a bit more about how to run uh, Kafka on uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes. And mainly, I have some more demos and things like that. So uh, bear with me during the first part. Uh, the second part should be less slides and more code. So uh, any one of you already knows Kafka or something like that? I, I know Kafka. I know. So if uh, what I will be talking about will be too boring for you, then let me know and we can skip some of the slides or go faster. But uh, so let's start first with some uh, description of what is Kafka. So there's a lot of definitions floating around. One of them could be that it's a publish subscribe messaging system. Another one is that it's a streaming data platform. Uh, another example is uh, distributed, horizontally scalable, fault-tolerant commit log. Uh, I like this one because it's full of uh, buzzwords. Uh, but so what's Kafka in uh, reality? It's a software which was developed at uh, LinkedIn back in 2010 or something like that. And it was open sourced. It's uh, kind of designed from ground to be fast, scalable. Uh, durable and available, so it's basically distributed by nature. It works uh, using some, so the, the scalability and distribution is done using something called data partitioning, which is basically sharding the data across the different nodes of the Kafka cluster, and uh, that allows to achieve uh, all these uh, user promises like high throughput, low latency, and ability to handle a lot of consumers and so on. Uh, what's important for me is that Kafka is more than just uh, the broker itself. Uh, it's quite a major ecosystem of different uh, tools. So the broker part of it is probably the one which is most uh, known. And that's what does the actual messaging. And then uh, there are some clients, some producers, consumers, and so on, and some management tools. But there are also other important components of the Kafka project, and that's Kafka Connect or Kafka Streams. And there's also something called uh, Mirror Maker. Uh, so let's go quickly through them. Uh, so the Kafka broker, that's kind of the central component, which actually does the messaging, the message distribution, and so on. Uh, the producers and consumers, uh, so directly of the part of the Kafka ecosystem, of the Apache Kafka project, are clients uh, for sending and receiving messages using Java. Uh, there used to be also some Scala clients, but they are now being uh, deprecated uh, in favor of uh, Java. So kind of the strategy going forward is that the uh, broker uh, system is written in Scala, but the producers and consumers are now transitioning to Java because kind of Java is more friendlier to the different uh, users. But at the same time, the advantages of Scala and so on are still being used uh, in the broker to deliver the performance and so on. There are also some admin tools, so they are both some clients for uh, programmatically managing the brokers, uh, but also some shell scripts which use these to create topics, delete topics, and so on. Uh, when Kafka is running, it requires a Zookeeper cluster, or in the Zookeeper terminology, it is called Ensemble. So basically, first you need to get a running uh, Zookeeper cluster, and then uh, you can only start the uh, Kafka cluster, and uh, Kafka is using Zookeeper basically to bootstrap itself, to find the different nodes, to store metadata, and so on. That's, uh, uh, it works normally, uh, but many people would see that as a, let's say, disadvantage. So the Zookeeper development uh, is not that active lately. 
for example, the latest stable version doesn't support uh, really SSL for encryption today. And uh, so I would see that as a weakness, but in general, it works. Uh, and then uh, the different clients uh, connect either directly to Kafka, which are the new producer and consumer clients in Java and most of the new management tools. Some of the older things are still connecting directly to Zookeeper, and that's kind of being currently phased out in the Apache Kafka community. Uh, quite important part of the ecosystem is Kafka Connect. That's basically a framework for transferring uh, data between Kafka and uh, other systems. And it kind of helps you write a uh, plugin which uh, can be scalable, can do load balancing, fault tolerance, data conversion, and so on, and yet uh, make it very easy to connect uh, your uh, Kafka with some other systems. So these connector plugins, there are normally always uh, two types of them, sync and source, whereas the sync uh, will uh, uh, basically sync the data from Kafka somewhere else, and the source will source the data from somewhere else into Kafka. Uh, as part of the Apache Kafka project itself, there are only two plugins which are part of the distribution, and that's kind of file sync and file source, so reading messages uh, from file and uh, sending them as Kafka messages or uh, writing uh, Kafka messages to files. But uh, online, you will find many different uh, plugins. Uh, they reach pretty much uh, across different technologies, uh, starting with different databases, uh, storage systems such as Amazon S3 or HDFS uh, uh, file system for Hadoop clusters. Uh, there are plugins for social networks, uh, for, uh, I don't know, IRC, I think I saw Slack one, and really a lot of different plugins which can uh, be used uh, with Kafka Connect. Kafka Streams, it's a bit different thing. Uh, it's uh, just a processing framework. Uh, it's basically a Java library which you can include in your application and it provides a high level uh, DSL language uh, for uh, uh, processing the data. It can do a lot of different things like transformations, aggregations, uh, stateful operations. And then basically at the end, it usually push the data back to, uh, uh, to Apache Kafka and uh, it can be used by another program. And uh, in the second part, I will use both Kafka Streams as well as uh, Kafka Connect uh, for a demo to uh, show you a bit uh, how it works, because I think these are a bit more interesting parts than just the uh, uh, regular consumer and uh, producer. Uh, and this is kind of a picture which shows how often the applications uh, work uh, in, uh, in Kafka. So you use the Kafka Connect with some uh, source plugin to get the data from some outside system into Kafka. Then you can use the Streams API to do the data processing, uh, where you take the data which you received, you do some aggregation, modification, transformation, and then uh, you put the data back in Kafka. And then you, for example, use another uh, Connect API sync plugin, which uh, will take the data and uh, push them again somewhere else. And uh, this can, as I said, it can work with different messaging systems, databases, uh, storage uh, platforms, uh, everything. So this is really useful. And you can do really a lot at a huge scale with uh, very few lines of code. Uh, another component is uh, something called Kafka Mirror Maker. So Kafka clusters do not work that well when split across multiple data centers uh, because uh, how the replication is done uh, between the topics. So it is often done the way that uh, uh, when you have multiple data centers, you set up a separate Kafka cluster in each data center, and then you use this mirror maker application to synchronize the data between these two clusters. And uh, uh, basically both this Mirror Maker and the uh, Kafka Streams client library, they just uh, encapsulate the producer and consumer clients and uh, make it much easier for you to use them um, without having to write so much code uh, on your own. 
uh, as for the data centers approach, uh, it's really about the uh, latency. So if you, for example, would have two data centers uh, uh, which are close to each other, uh, then uh, the latency between them might be small and the cluster might work fine. And that's at the end. So if you, for example, would run Kafka in Amazon AWS, there the different availability zones in one region are also separate data centers, but the latency between them is really great and the cluster works completely fine and you do not need to use the mirror maker. But for example, if you would want to use uh, one data center somewhere in Europe and one data center somewhere in the US or Asia, then uh, uh, the latency there would be uh, too big uh, for it to run properly. So that's why you would kind of separate, set up separate clusters and use the mirror maker uh, to replicate between them. So these were the components from the Apache Kafka project, but there's uh, really a ton of components uh, specific to Kafka, which are outside of that project, just as a kind of open source project uh, on GitHub and so on. So apart from the clients for different languages, which I already mentioned, and the uh, Kafka Connect plugins, there are different uh, management and monitoring consoles. Uh, there are some schema registries for storing uh, encoding schemas for the messages which you send using Kafka. There uh, is a REST proxy, which is quite popular, which allows you to bridge between HTTP and Kafka and does use Kafka with uh, every available HTTP client, basically. There is a big area of tools uh, which can be called cluster balancers, which are kind of uh, constantly monitoring your cluster and trying to optimize its performance. And uh, moreover, there's a ton of other projects which can uh, work... Uh, uh, which can work uh, with Kafka very well. And uh, as an example, I have here Apache Spark, but there's uh, more projects like this, which basically natively support connecting to Kafka and using Kafka. So that was about the uh, ecosystem. Any questions so far? No. Then uh, uh, let's talk briefly about the Kafka protocol. So the protocol which is used by Kafka, it's uh, a non-standard and uh, it's basically a binary protocol over TCP. Uh, and the protocol is always done using request response uh, message pairs where the client, so it's a uh, asymmetric protocol where the client is always sending the requests and the server is always responding to them. So uh, the requests uh, can be split into different groups. Uh, uh, there are some requests for getting metadata, sending messages, receiving messages. Then uh, there are some administration requests for uh, managing the Kafka itself and so on. I think this is not that important. Uh, what's a bit more important is how the message looks uh, which you receive or send. So the messages in the Kafka terminology are usually called uh, records. But basically, they have some structure, but they expect that everything is a byte array. So normally, the message has a timestamp, which is either set by the producer, or when the producer doesn't set the timestamp, then the broker will set the timestamp when uh, writing it uh, into the log. Uh, then there is some key for the message. And uh, the main part is the value with the message payload. And then there is some space for some headers, which are basically key value pairs, which you can attach to the message. And all of these are by default uh, byte arrays. And uh, Kafka doesn't really care at all whether what you put into the byte array, whether that's a string or uh, whether that's uh, uh, a JSON or whether it's some binary encoding. For Kafka, everything is a byte array, but then the clients for reading the messages or uh, consuming or uh, producing the messages, they uh, use different serializers and deserializers, which uh, make it much easier for you to, for example, send messages uh, in st with uh, string key and string value, uh, which will be automatically encoded as byte arrays and you don't really need to do it uh, manually. 
And uh, when Kafka is sending messages to achieve the high performance, uh, it usually tries to batch the messages. So both for uh, sending them over network as well as, as for storing on disk, they try to uh, always when there are more messages to be sent, they are kind of batched together and sent in uh, one big uh, piece of data and written to the disk in one big piece of data because that uh, makes it faster. Uh, when uh, you work with Kafka, you will usually talk about topics a lot uh, because topics is uh, the unit where you send the messages or receive the messages from. But uh, each topic consists from one or more partitions and uh, ultimately all the operations which the clients will be doing are always done on the partition level. So the topic is uh, really just a virtual term basically which uh, gives uh, a name to set of partitions, but it's the partitions which are being to work with. And the partitions are basically the data shards. So when you have a topic which has uh, 10 different partitions, then uh, uh, each message which you send to this topic will be always written only to a single partition. Why is this video window always jumping into the slides? Uh, so the partitioning uh, is done uh, based on the message key. So in the previous slide, I mentioned that the message is the key and the payload. And uh, the key is uh, what is used to assign the key to the partition. And uh, basically by default, if you use messages with keys, the key is used to generate some hash and the partitions work kind of as a hash table. So depending on the hash of the key, uh, the partition where the message should be stored is calculated and the message is sent to this particular partition. When you have uh, no key at all in your message, then uh, it will be kind of uh, uh, randomly distributed, uh, basically based on round robin principle. You can always also write your own logic, uh, how to decide which message should go into which partition. But uh, uh, that's uh, quite complicated and it's usually not recommended. And for most cases, you don't really need it. You can usually use the default uh, partitioning based on the message key. Each partition has also some cleanup policy. So when you create the partitions, you usually say that uh, you want to have the size of the partition limited either by uh, size or by age of the messages. So you can say something like, okay, this partition should be up to 100 gigabytes uh, big. And when you start getting messages over 100 gigabytes, start deleting the last messages, the, the first messages which were sent into the topic, the oldest ones. Uh, or you can do this uh, based on time. So you can kind of say, uh, if uh, this topic gets uh, messages older than one week, then start deleting these older messages and keep only the messages for one week. And uh, finally, another option is to say that the topic will be uh, compacted. And that basically means that uh, Kafka will use the keys of the messages and will always try to keep the latest uh, key for, uh, for each uh, message. And these policies can be all combined together and they can kind of create an interesting architecture where you always uh, keep uh, the messages for each key for unlimited time, for example, which allows you to reconstruct a database from beginning and things like that. So this picture tries to demonstrate uh, how the producer sends the messages to the partitions. So it's actually uh, the approach chosen by Kafka is kind of a stupid broker and very smart client. So the partitioning itself, it's not really done on the broker, but it's done on the producer side. And the producer is sending the messages uh, into different partitions. And the only thing which the broker does is it just writes the, the message uh, into the log at uh, some position. And the position is called uh, offset. Uh, 
and all the new messages are basically appended uh, at the end of the log. So when now the producer sends another message, which will be uh, based on the key, for example, sent to partition one, then it would create uh, a message on the offset number seven. And uh, it's really the client which is looking uh, at uh, the key and uh, deciding into which partition the message should go. So as a result, if these partitions are hosted by different uh, instances of the Kafka broker, then the producer needs a lot of different connections to different uh, brokers to connect there. I think I have later a bigger, better picture to demonstrate that. The consumer works a bit differently, but the approach is again the same. The broker is fairly stupid and the client is the smart one. So the broker really doesn't have in the partition, doesn't have anything else than the journal log with the records and the offsets on which they are written. And when the consumer connects to the partition, it tells the broker something like, okay, give me the message from offset eight. And the broker just uh, finds in the journal the message on the offset number eight and sends the message back to the consumer. And uh, uh, that way the consumer for all the partitions it consumes, it basically always tells the broker handling this partition, okay, give me the, the offset number this and receives the message. So unlike uh, if you know more traditional messaging brokers like, I don't know, RabbitMQ or, uh, or ActiveMQ or something like that, there it's usually the broker who is kind of tracking uh, what should be the next message which will be sent to the client and which messages have been already consumed by someone and so on. This is completely different in Kafka because here it's really the consumer who always tells the broker, give me the message from offset. Uh, N and gets the message and the Kafka doesn't really really remember anything. So if the consumer here was reading from the offset eight right now, but for whatever reason decides it's time to start from the beginning, the consumer can just send the fetch request to the broker saying, uh, oh, hey, give me now the messages from offset zero. And the broker doesn't really have problem with it. it will, as long as the offset zero was not yet deleted because of the cleanup policies, and it's still present in the journal, it will just go to the offset zero and send the consumer the message from the offset zero. Yeah. So all the logic about which message do you want to receive is basically implemented in the consumer and not in the broker like with many other systems. So that's kind of introduction to the partitioning concept. There's another concept which is called replication. So the partitioning, that's about uh, being able to scale uh, horizontally and being able to improve the throughput and the latency and so on. The replication is more about data redundancy and high availability. So when you create the topic, you usually give uh, Kafka two numbers. One is the number of partitions which you want to create and other one is the number of replicas which you want to create. And uh, the number of replicas basically mean that if you say that, for example, you want to have a replication factor of three, then every partition which you create will be created three times. So there will be three copies of uh, the same partition and one of these copies will be chosen a leader. And that's where the producers and consumers will be communicating with and the other partitions will be called followers. And these will be basically the backup replicas. They will uh, also connect to the leader and talk with the leader, but all they will do will be downloading, basically reading the data from the leader, leader and storing them uh, in themselves as well. And then when the leader for whatever reason crashes or isn't available, then these replicas are basically able to uh, take over one of them will be elected as the new leader and can be used by all the clients uh, uh, and uh, be it producers or consumers or streams or whatever else. And uh, the operations can continue without any significant downtimes or anything like that. Uh, you can 
kind of configure how much guarantee you want. So obviously you can say, I want to use replication factor one, so I don't want to have any replicas. But uh, you can also say, I want to have uh, several replicas, but I don't need all of them to be uh, in sync. The replica being in sync means that it has exactly the same messages as the lead replica has. So if the following replica is kind of fast enough to keep up with uh, the leader, then it is called in sync replica. And uh, that's important because it means that uh, when the leader dies, there will be no data, no messages which you will lose. But uh, if uh, depending on the kind of your messages and how important they are, Obviously, if you want to have all replicas always in sync, that can introduce some additional latency because the producer sends the message to the to the topic. Then uh, first, before it's sent to the consumer, it needs to be consumed and confirmed by the followers that they receive this message and that they are in sync. And only then this message can be handed over to the consumers which are connected there. Uh, but this, of course, guarantees that you will not lose any message you can kind of loosen this thing and say, I want to keep the replicas, but I'm not that strict that they have to be always in sync replicas. And that means that they will kind of do the replication only in uh, best effort. And uh, uh, in that case, the, when the producer sends the message to the topic, uh, it will not wait for all the replicas to confirm that they received the message and that they have it. And instead, they will just pass it to the replicas, but also send it to the consumers as well. And uh, that gives you lower latency, but it also gives you kind of less uh, reliability. Because it means that if the leader suddenly crashes, maybe the replicas didn't have uh, all the messages uh, which were in the leader. And thus, uh, you can kind of have some message loss. But then later when I talk about the, the use cases for Kafka, there are many use cases where kind of uh, the losing few messages is not that the big problem. So that's why kind of you have to configure the Kafka and uh, adapt the architecture to the needs which your application has. So this is a picture which tries to show uh, how it, for example, looks when you have a free cluster consisting of three Kafka brokers, so one, two, and three. And then you have uh, two topics, topic one and topic two. And each of these topics has always two partitions and three replicas. So uh, the topic one, the partition one has the leader hosted uh, here on the broker one. And uh, the follower replicas, they are on the broker two and broker three. And then when you are creating the topics, basically Kafka is trying to uh, distribute the load. So for the next partition, which would be the partition two for the topic one, the leader would be the broker two. And in that case, kind of this is where the consumers or producers for this partition would connect and the broker one and broker two are only followers. And uh, the same way the, the arrows are not here, but the same way it would work for the topic two. And uh, uh, so even the brokers among themselves, they have a lot of different connections for doing the data replication. And uh, now what happens when uh, the broker three suddenly dies? The Kafka cluster will see that uh, one of the brokers was lost and we'll see, so in the previous cluster, the topic two partition one had a leader on the broker three. So for this broker, the leader will be suddenly lost and there will be a new re-election between the two followers. So the broker one and broker two, and one of these will be selected a new leader and will start uh, taking care of this uh, partition and the clients which were connected uh, to the broker two uh, there's actually a typo here that should be free to the broker three should reconnect uh, to the broker two and continue producing and consuming the data from there uh, yeah, I already mentioned this, that the clients are really smart. So normally when uh, you uh, 
connect uh, when the client is connecting to the broker you supply the client with something called bootstrap servers and uh, the bootstrap servers that can be a subset of uh, of the members of the cluster it can be just selected node of the cluster you can use some uh, round robin load balancer for the bootstrap server but basically the client first connects to this bootstrap server and asks him an only thing give me metadata and this metadata they contain the information about what topics uh, exist in this cluster what partitions do they have and which brokers are currently the leaders for the partitions so the client connects to the bootstrap server gets back the metadata then looks at the metadata and uh, let's say your client is a producer who wants to write to a topic uh, uh, two partitions one and uh, two uh, from the picture here so basically the metadata will tell the client okay for the partition two of topic two you need to connect to broker one for the partition one of topic two you need to connect to broker two so based on this metadata the client will open uh, a subsequent uh, connections to these brokers who are the leaders for the partitions and then starts reading and consuming the messages and uh, uh, that uh, has some uh, advantages and disadvantages so because there's kind of no load balancing happening other than uh, asking a random broker for the metadata uh, that means that uh, you are not actually wasting any CPU cycles and any latency on uh, doing the load balancing between the brokers. But it also means that in theory the clients, uh, they do a lot of TCP connections to all the different brokers. Because if you have, for example, a producer who is producing to a topic with uh, 100 partitions, each partition being on a different broker then uh, this uh, client needs to have uh, 100 uh, tcp connections up and running because they are not load balanced they go always directly to the broker who is the leader uh, yeah this is pretty much what i already talked about so uh, the uh, partition where the message is sent that's uh, calculated based on the key I already said that the messages are written always to the leader we said it as well and this acknowledge mode this basically is uh, how you control the uh, the guarantee for the messages you are sending so that's this what I described you can kind of send the message uh, without any guarantees where the client just fires the, the producer just fires the message and doesn't care what happens with it then uh, you can kind of get the acknowledgement when the message is written uh, only to the leader partition which is kind of it guarantees that go to the broker but in case the leader dies in the next uh, millisecond this message might be lost or you can say that you want to get the message into all of the replicas which is kind of the highest level of guarantees but it can be also the slowest uh, guarantee uh, the consumers I also talked quite a lot about them but uh, not about everything on this slide so the consumers they always read from one or more partitions and I already described how they track the commits and how the consumers are always the ones who come to the broker and say, oh, give me the message from uh, the offset uh, number 120. And uh, that means but that the client has to keep track of the offset somewhere. Yeah? So you need to know uh, in the client that, uh, for example, even after the client crashes and restarts or something like that, that the last message you processed was from the offset 100 and that uh, the next message you should start with should be 101. And uh, you can pretty much uh, store the offset uh, wherever you want. So you can, for example, do it uh, in a, I don't know, relational database in a file uh, on the disk of the computer. But what's usually done is that uh, there is a special topic in the Kafka broker itself, which is called underscore underscore consumer offsets. And uh, that's used by the clients to store the offsets directly in Kafka. So uh, they basically send a message which describes the consumer ID and so on 
and the topic and the partition for which the offset is as the key and then uh, use the offset as the value and then uh, when uh, they when you start a new instance of this client which should be responsible for reading from some partition it will basically go to this consumer offsets topic read uh, all data in the topic until it finds uh, the particular key which it is interested in gets the offset from this uh, key and then use this offset to read from the partition so that's kind of the easiest way how you can do it and that's what uh, is usually used but as i said so in theory you can store the offset uh, wherever you want and it doesn't have to be in uh, kafka uh, the consumers they have different uh, quality of services or guarantees so they support the usuals uh, at most ones at least ones exactly ones uh, where again basically depending on when you commit uh, you can uh, lose some messages you can get some duplicates uh, the exactly ones delivery is actually done using uh, uh, every message has uh, some uh, id and that id can be used to automatically detect uh, duplicates and filter them out and uh, normally in the producer when we talked about these different acknowledge modes, the client always gets only the messages which were already, so to say, acknowledged by the broker to the producer. So if you would be using this uh, strongest uh, guarantee that the messages have to be written to all replicas before the producer gets the acknowledgement, then this also means that uh, the message has to be written into all replicas before the consumer gets this message. Yeah, because that means that the mess the consumer will never get a message which uh, won't be kind of acknowledged uh, to the uh, to the uh, to, to the producer at the end. And uh, this shows kind of uh, how the different producers and consumers need to connect to the different uh, brokers at the same time. So. Uh, as you can see in this picture, there is a producer and consumer for the topic one and producer and consumer to the topic two. And each of them, uh, uh, so there are two consumers for topic two. And the producers, they are always connected to all the brokers which have the leaders for this topic. So uh, in this case, uh, there is a connection to the broker one and to the broker two. And in this case, it's to the one and three. Uh, the consumers, they don't necessarily need to read from all of the topics. So uh, this consumer is reading both uh, partitions of the topic, whereas these two consumers, they are each reading only one partition. And uh, why is that uh, is explained on the next slide. Uh, and that's uh, about how the consumers uh, decide which partitions should they consume. So if uh, you would have uh, two consumers who would be kind of trying to run in parallel each produce each, each consume uh, one slice uh, of the data uh, then uh, you usually want uh, that uh, they don't produce then they, they don't consume single message twice and uh, for example do some operation on it two times so if you have a topic with 10 partitions and uh, two parallel consumers you need to somehow make sure that uh, they are not reading the same partition while for example nobody is reading some other partitions and that's achieved using something called uh, consumer groups uh, when you have the consumer and you connect with it to the brokers you specify a consumer group which is just a string uh, name uh, of uh, the consumer group where you are in and the consumers will basically communicate with each other and decide all consumers in the same consumer group they will decide which uh, consumer should consume which uh, partition and that's done uh, in a kind of negotiation where one of these consumers will be a group lead and will be deciding which responsible which consumer is responsible for uh, what and then uh, share that through Kafka brokers with the other consumers. So uh, 
this is a good picture which shows how it works in reality. So there's a topic with four partitions and there's a con uh, group one with two consumers and group two with three consumers. And uh, so these are always member of the same group. And when they connect to the broker, one of these will be the leader and will decide, okay, this consumer will be reading from partition zero and one, and this consumer will be reading from partition two and three. Uh, whereas in this, uh, so it's kind of nicely divided. In the group two, there are three consumers, so it's not that nicely divided, but they still divided it uh, among each other. Now, this has some consequences. Uh, when one of the consumers dies, the consumer lead, the group lead for this consumer group will see that and will automatically decide how uh, the partitions should be redistributed. So in this case, uh, it would kind of take the two partitions, two and three, read by the consumer which crashed and uh, reassign them between the brokers. That's, uh, th when that happens, that's kind of called rebalancing. Uh, and it kind of creates a short uh, outage or stop uh, between the consumers. So when the rebalancing happens, the consumers basically stop reading the data. Uh, the group lead uh, decides what should be the new partitions assignment, tells that to the consumers, the consumers connect to the right partitions and continue reading the data. So usually this is very quick, but uh, you can then see it in the logs uh, as rebalancing when uh, you would do that. And similarly, when this client would start again, then uh, the group lead will decide on the rebalance and assign it again some uh, partitions to consume. Uh, however, given how the system works, that means that if you would have uh, a group uh, with five consumers, but only four partitions in the topic, one of the consumers will be basically being idle, not do anything and just wait. Because uh, each partition can be, be consumed only by one instance uh, from a single consumer group. So, uh, this is not necessarily a bad situation that you have more consumers, but it just means that this, the last consumer will be waiting and if one of the other consumer crashes, it will be immediately available to replace him. But uh, it basically means that when creating the topics, you should uh, make uh, a careful, careful decision about how many partitions you want in the topic. Because uh, if you say, I want to have only four partitions in this topic, but then you find out that your consumers are doing some uh, heavy lifting with the messages and are kind of slow, then uh, it would mean that you can't really run uh, 100 consumers in parallel against four topics. Yeah, so the maximum number of active parallel consumers in a single consumer group is always the number of partitions in the group. However, the more partitions you have, that kind of increase the loads on the brokers on kind of managing the partitions and the leaders for the partitions and so on. So at the same time, you should not really always say, okay, I uh, will probably use only five consumers in parallel, but just to be sure, let's create the topic with thousand partitions because that will be always enough for me. So that's kind of... Uh, architecture decision which you need to take when you start using uh, Kafka. Yeah, and this is pretty much just what I explained. So something more about the internals of Kafka brokers. So always one of the brokers is elected uh, a controller and that's the broker which, uh, apart from all the other duties, is also responsible for deciding uh, and kind of maintaining the leadership follower, the leader follower relationship for all the partitions. So this is the one which uh, is monitoring whether all the nodes in the cluster are running and one of them shutdowns, it kind of starts deciding uh, who should be the new leader for this partition and uh, who should be the follower. And all these elections are done through Zookeeper. So I don't know how much you know about uh, Zookeeper, but it's kind of uh, key value storage. 
which can be also used. Uh, it has a support basically for, it can be kind of used as a distributed log manager as well. So uh, that's what uh, Kafka is using to see whether the brokers are running or whether the brokers were shut down and uh, to see whether uh, who is the leader for uh, which replica and share this information. And uh, it also uses Zookeeper to store uh, the data about the topic configuration. So when you create a topic with some partitions, that will be always stored in uh, the Zookeeper itself, as well as some additional information. So uh, uh, there are some access control list uh, rules in Kafka which say which user is allowed to read or write from which topics and so on. So these are also stored in Zookeeper. Some uh, user credentials, usernames, passwords, and so on can be stored in Zookeeper. Uh, Kafka allows you to say that some consumers have some uh, speed limits, some quotas, how fast they can read the messages and so on. That's again stored with Zookeeper. So it's kind of a metadata store for, uh, for the Kafka. Uh, some explanation about why Kafka is so fast. So uh, I've mentioned it already several times, this kind of uh, stupid broker or dumb broker smart clients approach. But what this uh, dumb broker allows them to do is uh, to basically do the zero copy approach, <clears throat> which makes Kafka so fast. So the uh, there is no copying of the messages in the memory several times and keeping them in the memory of the Kafka itself. What basically Kafka does, it gets the messages uh, on the TCP connection from the clients. It, uh, as they are, it writes them through the kernel uh, into the disk, into the journals. And then uh, when it's uh, reading the data from the disk, it uh, basically reads the message from the disk and immediately without any changes, without any in-memory copying and so on, pushes them to the TCP connection to the consumer. So that's what makes it uh, very fast. Another thing which makes it fast is uh, the batching of the messages. So uh, again, I already mentioned this, it tries to kind of batch messages from the clients into a bigger uh, chunks of data and write these uh, to the TCP connections on, or to the disk at the same time, because that's kind of uh, faster for them. And uh, it basically avoids uh, random disk access uh, completely. So the journal on the disk, the log, it's really just a sequential log of the messages. And basically 99% of the cases, the consumer will connect and say, okay, give me the messages starting with the offset number 100 and then goes 100, 100, 1, uh, 2, 3 and so on. So basically it doesn't do any jumping uh, across the log from one place to another to get messages based on some filters or something like that. It's really just you give it a starting place and then you read the messages from the starting place on. And the same is the writing. So the writing is basically always just appending uh, to the commit log uh, in a, at the end of the commit log. So that's again, no random access. Everything is just a sequential access. And uh, ultimately when you avoid random disk access, but do everything sequentially, even for example, traditional non-SSD hard drives can be really fast in that. And uh, you can get really good speeds. And that's again something what the traditional brokers like uh, RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ, they cannot really do it because they have uh, many parallel consumers to the same uh, queue. Uh, they need to give one message to this consumer, other message to other consumer. Then some of the consumers can use uh, filtering to get only some messages from the queue. So it cannot really avoid the random disk access. It cannot really avoid uh, storing copies of the message in the memory. Uh, so that's what makes them slow. Instead, Kafka is only using the sequential disk access and uh, it doesn't really store the messages in the memory because uh, on the Unix-based operating system, there is this uh, file system cache. 
So if the server has a free uh, free RAM, then it will automatically try to cache the files which are being written and which are being accessed. So it will basically, the way it works in the operating system is that it just maps the segments of the disk to the segments of the memory. And so when you have enough uh, free memory, basically, the messages are not even being read from the, from the hard drive, but they are being read from this uh, file system cache. So it's very fast. But uh, uh, Kafka doesn't really have to store its own copy of the messages in the memory. And uh, then it's also fast because of the horizontal scaling. Uh, so you can really have thousands of partitions for a single topic, which is running on thousands of machines. And thanks to that, you can handle these huge uh, workloads. If you have traditional broker like, like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ, there the partitioning uh, is not that easy because of how the consumers work and how the broker is responsible for distributing the messages. So uh, you can kind of uh, create a larger clusters which uh, pretend to be kind of one broker with many different queues split across the machines, but you cannot really do the sharding where you say, okay, this queue will be actually stored on thousand separate machines. And you can do that in Kafka. And again, that's what makes it fast. It brings also some disadvantages uh, for which I have uh, some slides uh, later in the presentation. I talked about Zookeeper already. So why should you use uh, Kafka? Uh, and this is pretty much just a summary of all the things uh, which I was talking about. And uh, uh, this is what you will find as the main uh, advantages of Kafka everywhere online. So that's the scalability. That's the amazing performance. It, uh, because of how it works with the lock, which always only appends and the consumers who read from the offset they say, it has a message order guarantee within a single partition. So once the message is written to the partition, then the order is fixed and it will never change. So the client will not unintentionally get the message from offset five before getting the message from the offset four. So if the client really wants, the client can kind of jump between the offsets and intentionally say, okay, I want to now jump forward to the offset number 100. But uh, by default, you will always read the messages in order and you know that the order is guaranteed. Uh, and another advantage, uh, which is often very useful, is message rewind or replay, if you want, which basically means that... Uh, at any time, the client can say, okay, now uh, whatever, I'm at the message 100, but I want to start freshly from the beginning. So it tells the broker, give me the messages uh, from offset zero, and it starts basically from uh, the beginning. So if uh, your application didn't work or something like that, you can easily, if it had some bug, you can easily start from the beginning and reprocess all the data after fixing the bug. Now, uh, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So obviously all these nice things about Kafka, they have also some consequences. So this uh, dumb broker, smart clients, uh, that's a nice thing, but it means that you need to be much more careful with your architecture. And uh, you have to really think it through uh, before you actually implement it. So with the traditional brokers like ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ, the kind of intelligence which is built into the broker can help you to go away with some mistakes you made in the architecture. You cannot do it with Kafka. And the things which I mean with it is, for example, these things like uh, how many partitions should you use for your uh, topic. If you uh, kind of have the no number of partitions which doesn't fit the number of parallel consumers, then uh, yeah, it will not really work for you. So you really should think uh, through how exactly will your clients work, how they will uh, consume the messages, 
how if you it's kind of easy to say okay i want to use many partitions but then you will have to make a careful decision about what will be the key for the message because the key for the message will decide into which partition it uh, goes uh, another trick is kind of with the scalability so because of how the scalability works there's no load balancing between the clients and the brokers uh, that's something i again already mentioned but that means that uh, in some cases your clients can have many many tcp connections and uh, it also for example makes so kafka is really great uh, for some internet of things use cases but not kind of uh, as uh, the first thing in line where the, some mobile devices or some uh, sensors will be connecting and sending the messages directly because you would need to expose a potentially very huge cluster to somewhere to some network where the sensors are running and the sensors might need to maintain a lot of different connections and so on so that's why for these use cases it's much better to have for example something like this http rest uh, gateway uh, running there for these devices to connect and not have them connect directly to Kafka. Another thing is that this whole uh, partitioning thing has its limits in some cases. Uh, who of you heard about uh, Pareto principle or the 80-20 principle? Uh, it kind of says that in many cases 80% uh, of uh, let's say transactions are caused only by 20% of uh, operations or customers. So uh, before I joined Red Hat, for example, I worked for a stock exchange, uh, which did the trading with stocks and futures and options. And uh, there, the trading was done in different stocks, for example, for different uh, companies, and was done by different traders, but ultimately, I don't know, 90% of the trading was coming, for example, from the top uh, five products. And 90% uh, of the trading was done by, I don't know, 10 uh, biggest banks or biggest companies. So now here's the question, if the partitioning is done based on the key, what key will you use in such case? Because uh, if you have this kind of split, it might mean that even if you use uh, 1,000 partitions, 90% of the traffic will be coming into the five partition and the remaining 900 something partitions will be basically idle. So in that case, the scalability kind of uh, doesn't really scale because you can't really distribute the data across the partitions. Uh, and uh, another place where to be careful is uh, that the message ordering is guaranteed always only within a single partition. So uh, uh, again, there's no uh, single order for everything. The order is only within the partition. In most cases, this is completely fine because you want to have the order for the messages with the same key and the messages with the same key will be always in the same uh, partition. But uh, uh, you have to be careful when designing the system that it really works for you. Uh, that said, I didn't want it with this slide to discourage you from using Kafka. It's a great uh, product which has uh, definitely a place and which is useful in many, many cases. But it's not kind of uh, some miracle solution which solves all the problems and uh, uh, doesn't have any downsides. So what are the common use cases uh, where you can use Kafka? Uh, one of them is messaging and data integration. So uh, that's basically the same thing as the traditional messaging systems. Uh, you can kind of, there's kind of a lot of people who are trying to replace the enterprise service bus uh, with a messaging based on Kafka and uh, it works well for the data integration. Uh, one of the advantages here is often the possibility to replay the data stream. And uh, especially if uh, you uh, need the scale which only Kafka allows, then uh, Kafka is a great solution for this. Uh, another use case uh, could be website activity tra tracking. That's pretty much uh, where it all started at LinkedIn. Uh, 
So uh, you can use it to kind of track the movement of the user through your website or through your uh, e-shop or something like that, uh, tracking which uh, pages it went through, which products uh, the user looked at, uh, and so on. And you can send these as a messages. Uh, you can use, for example, the username as the key. So that will make sure that all the events for a single user get into some partition. And uh, uh, the order will be guaranteed. And then you can use some application to kind of analyze this data. Uh, collecting operational metrics and doing some alerting on them. That's uh, another fairly common use case. And if you have a big system, you have a lot of different metrics. So uh, the scalability is definitely useful here. Uh, similar use case is uh, log aggregation, uh, where you can collect the logs from uh, different systems and then, for example, push them into something like Elasticsearch or something like that. Uh, stream processing, that means that uh, basically your Kafka system will be getting a uh, stream of different events and you can then use Kafka for kind of real-time or near-time uh, analysis and transformation and uh, processing of this data. And uh, then there's event sourcing which kind of describes uh, state changes which are locked uh, in a as a time ordered uh, sequences. And you can, for example, use that for, uh, for database replication where you use uh, tools like Debezium to collect uh, events like inserts, updates, deletes uh, from your SQL database, for example, then send them to a, as a stream of events into your Kafka cluster. And there you can do some monitoring or reconstruct the database again from it and so on. And that's pretty much it for the first part. Questions? Yeah, yeah I have a question. Nobody? Uh, yeah, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, first question is that I have uh, also, we should be uh, interested as you are uh, uh, a member of Red Hat. Uh, what is the, what about the security in Kafka? If I want to, uh, for example, send some kind of sensitive data. I'm not talking about CV codes, but for example, personal data in Europe, which should be, for example, somehow secured. Um, what's uh, what's the So uh, the, I would say Kafka itself supports uh, what's usual for this kind of software. So uh, for authentication, you can use uh, either kind of locally or in Zookeeper store usernames and passwords where you, I actually think I have some backup slide here for security. Uh, you can, uh, or you can use Kerberos uh, for uh, authentication or you can use uh, TLS uh, client authentication so you can authenticate with certificates. Uh, Kafka itself also supports uh, SSL for encryption, of course. And uh, then it has kind of a pluggable authorization mechanism where you can either kind of write your own implementation using your own uh, system, or uh, you can use kind of the default implementation, which is part of Kafka, is that it stores the, uh, the access rules in the zookeeper and that's using them to define uh, which user can access what. Uh, in terms of storing the data for a long term on the, on the disk in Kafka, there's no special support for encrypting these data or anything like that, if that's what you meant. Uh, what uh, is simply expected there that uh, you can use kind of the operating system level encryption uh, of the disk as one option. So that's, uh, I don't know, if you would run your Kafka in Amazon AWS, then you should definitely have the disks encrypted there. Or alternatively, you can kind of do your own encryption of the messages itself on uh, in the client. So uh, for Kafka, doesn't really care for the message payloads. Uh, it, uh, it's, as I said, it's really just a byte array. So you can use your own uh, co uh, encryption algorithms, for example, to encrypt the payloads before you send them to Kafka and then decrypt them again in the consumer when you receive them. Uh, 
but there's no special support for that. Uh, there was uh, in uh, so in EU there's now this GDPR regulation, yeah. which uh, defines this. Uh, to be honest, I don't know exactly what it says, but it should be some right to be deleted from the database and so on. And that was a big topic uh, for Kafka because uh, ultimately if you, for example, you can use Kafka really kind of like a database <clears throat> where, for example, you push all the user information into a topic, but then when the user comes and says, oh, I want to be deleted from this topic, that's uh, not that easy to achieve because it's not like a SQL database where you just uh, run some delete command and it's deleted. But basically, the usual answer there is to use the compacted topics where uh, if you store the data about the user with kind of the username as the key and then the data in the payload, in the compacted topics, you can kind of delete the record from the database completely by uh, sending a message which has the same key but has a null uh, payload. That kind of in the compacted topics, uh, normally Kafka always tries to keep the latest record uh, with uh, given key. But uh, with this null payload, Kafka will take it kind of as a sign that you want to delete this key from the topic. So that's kind of what you can use to selectively delete some of the, some of the messages from given topic. Right. Anybody else want to say any questions? Hmm. Maybe we have some competitor. Uh, competitor? Do you, see, do you know any competitors for Kafka? Uh, I, I, no one. We, we use uh, our, our No, no, no. Uh, I actually, we actually wanted to, to take a Kafka and then we, uh, we took it uh, after all. But uh, first I actually tried the RSS log. Use it with, uh, for collecting uh, metrics. It works also perfectly. Uh, the probably now m most active competitor, but I kind of the name got out of my head right now. So let me uh, uh, let me Google it. Uh, Uh, yeah, pools are exactly. So there's a project called Apache Pulsar, and that's kind of a, that's not coming from LinkedIn, that's coming from Yahoo, but it has uh, pretty much the same uh, characteristics. Uh, let me increase the size a bit so that you can maybe better see it. So it has a similar characteristics and it's probably right now, uh, I'm not sure whether it's really competitor because it's much younger project, but uh, this project seems to be very active and uh, is kind of trying to play the better Kafka role. So uh, there are some differences. For example, the storage of the messages is done uh, differently and there are other things, but I would say right now the ecosystem isn't uh, that great, although maybe over the time it will get there. And uh, as at least as an open source project is not uh, as much uh, matured as uh, Kafka, which is older, but uh, this would be probably the competition I would be most interested in. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, so I think. Thank you very much. Uh, this was that was great. Uh, I liked it. Uh, I think we can uh, make a, a small break up for coffee here yeah. and get back to you in the in the ten minutes or something. Okay. So uh, let's continue at uh, yeah in ten minutes. That would be half past. Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, guys. Right. Cheers. <laughs>